Yes. So um, a very good afternoon and welcome to the Embiosis webinar lecture series four in 2021. I'm Go, your moderator for today. And you have just seen the 15th anniversary video of Embiosis. Do learn more about uh, our institute through the uh, website and also social media. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook for the latest update. We welcome all to use our services and collaborate with us. Uh, just a background, Embassy's webinar series is established to provide an international platform for knowledge and research sharing in the field of omics, molecular and computational uh, biology. There are some housekeeping rules. The lecture will be about 45 minutes and followed by a 15 minute Q&A, depending on how many questions we have. You can post the question in the Zoom chat box or our Facebook live page. Uh, I'll read them out at the end of the talk during the Q&A session. Please stay tuned until the end to fill in the attendance for the e-certificate and for UCAM, you can earn a spell point. Uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our speaker, Prof. Dr. Masaroni, uh, uh, Masa Nori Arita from the National Institute of Genetic Japan. Um, Prof. Arita earned a PhD in information science and started his career as a term researcher at the Electro Technical Lab in Tsukuba. He moved to Computational Biology Research Center of AIST Japan as his starting member in 2001 and was later appointed as an Associate Professor of Computational Biology at the University of Tokyo in 2003. Then he joined Riken Plant Science Center in 2007 and worked on plant metabolomics with Prof. Kazuki, Kazuki Saito. And then most of the audience will be familiar with Prof. Kazuki Saito. Currently, he is the head of the DNA Data Bank of Japan, DDBJ. If you are familiar with NCBI, that is the equivalent in Japan. And the professor at NIG in Mishima, Japan, and a team leader at the Center for Sustainable Resource Science in Riken. Okay, so let us welcome Prof. Uh, Dr. Masaroni uh, Arita to share his research findings. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, as introduced, my background is computer science. And today I will uh, introduce how computation or computers can work for metabolomics. So I will uh, make my slide full screen. No, it's not working. Okay, and the most important problem in metabolomics is the number of identifiable metabolites. We want to increase the number, of course, but how can we do easily and efficiently? Because in metabolomics, basically, you can identify metabolites for which you have fewer compounds. First, you need to measure those pure materials on your own platform and record retention time and mass spectra. And you keep all of them as your own library. And using that, your personal or institutional library, you measure biological samples and start identification. So basically, what you can identify is limited to what you have in your laboratory. That's a big problem. So as far as uh, back in 2006, uh, I and other researchers started to create a spectral database called MassBank. MassBank was, uh, as far as I know, uh, the oldest spectral library that are freely shared and it's been uh, ongoing still, not only in Japan, but also in Germany and also in the United States as MassBank family or MassBank consortium. I myself um, is not maintaining the original MassBank any longer. Now it's in the hands of Japanese Society of Mass Spectrometry 
But anyway, I'm one of the initial member developing this database. And after that, uh, I started to work on compu computational software program. And most well known is called MS Dial. The developer is Dr. Hiroshi Tsugawa in my team in Riken. And this software program has been used by more than 1,000 research groups all over the world. And in association with this software program, MS Dial, we also provide various spectral libraries for identification. This is because uh, this is the reason why MS Dial became so widespread and exploited. It comes with a very big spectral library and de determination or identification of compounds was made much easier. So what I believe is providing free data and software platforms uh, is very important. But at the same time, we uh, have to consider about other databases and other software platforms. So data standardization and ontology is also an important part. So I will explain these activities in metabolomics in my talk. But before going into metabolomic activities, let me briefly explain about genomics activities. Everybody knows about the human, International Human Genome Project. Uh, it was uh, how uh, tentatively finished in year 2000. And this nature issue was, uh, this nature, uh, yes, volume was issued for free, for, for free completely. And this particular special issue on human genome is still freely available for everybody. You can access it online. And among its major articles is this one titled Mining the Draft Human Genome. And I think uh, this article in year 2001 is one of the earliest uh, article mentioning genome mining. Now in uh, year 2020, genome mining is uh, used in somewhat different meaning. Gen when we p uh, talk about genome mining, people think about identification of gene function uh, in bacteria or fungi, but not in high, higher order animals or uh, in human. But basically, the word genome mining was used at least in the Human Genome Project and is a key word to associate genome project with computation. And two years ago, there was a very interesting article uh, in this genome mining field. It's partly uh, involves metabolomics be because it uses a mass spectrometry in its analysis. And this article uh, is uh, looking for a responsible gene cluster uh, for this metabolite, lysiumine A, B, C, and D. And lysiumine uh, comes from this uh, fruit uh, of plant lysium barbarum. This is used for uh, herbal medicine in China, in Korea, and also in Japan. And this fruit, uh, you can find this in a kind of deserted land everywhere in Japan, but this fruit contains these resuming uh, struct molecular structures. But, and from its structure, from its um, overview, people uh, thought about uh, this is a part of uh, polyketides. But in fact, the authors of this article uh, hypothesized that 
this molecular structure is not coming from polyketides, but from non-ribosomal peptides. So uh, from the uh, amino acid structure, actually part of them are not looking like amino acid, but the authors estimated the original form of uh, non-ribosomal peptide, I mean the sub subsequence of amino acids, and looked for that sequence in transcriptome results of these plant species. Then, one particular gene called LBA LCYA. And this particular gene contained a frequent repeat of that amino acid. In this case, QPW, GBGSW in red letters. Yeah. And this, the existence of this gene strongly suggested that lysiumine compounds are not from polyketides, but from these amino acids. So this gene produces a kind of proto-protein, and this proto-protein is somehow uh, excited, digested, to produce particular peptides. In this case, this uh, red part for lysiumine B and blue amino acids for lysiumin D and yellow one for lysiumin A. And this hypothesis was confirmed by meta targeted metabol metabolic profiling for lysiumin structures. And the authors indeed identified a corresponding lysiumin mass spectra in the analysis. So, this is a very beautiful combination between genome mining and metabolic profiling. And I really uh, want to perform this kind of analysis, not only for these particular medicinal plants, but for all kinds of plant species and also fungi and bacteria. That's my hope. But of course, genome and metabolome are far apart. Genome has been investigated extensively in many, many countries. And the basic steps are like this. First step is uh, unrestricted access to DNA databases or DNA sequences. Then using all those sequences, researchers predict gene functions or researchers re-annotate entire genome. Then hypotheses are built and confirmed by experiments or computational analysis and so on. This is genome mining or other people call it bioinformatics. To do the same in metabolome data, what we need is first retrieval or access to raw metabolomic information. We need to access to raw peak information, but here we hit on a problem. Uh, there are not so many repositories for metabolome data, um, but at least uh, metabolites from European Bioinformatics Institute, EBI, is a good data resource. So we can use metabolites to download raw mass spec data. Then for that data, we need to apply software programs to identify molecular formulas, molecular structures, and so on. And again, we hit upon a problem because there are not so many software programs, software platforms, and it, some quite often it's difficult to use them. So these are the two major obstacles in metabolomics, data repository and software platforms. So, uh, as I stated in the first part, I have been creating uh, spectral databases and also software platforms. The most important part in metabolomics is the identification of metabolites, but 
immediate identification or exact identification, uh, these are very, very difficult. At least we want to predict molecular formula. And this is actually the key part in metabolomics. If we can precisely identify, or if we can precisely uh, predict molecular formula, then it will greatly reduce the possible molecular structures. So we want, in other words, if we make an error for the est est estimation of molecular formula, we can never predict molecular structure. So the determination of formula is ex very, very important. And for that particular purpose, uh, we will use various methods. Of course, we can apply different types of software programs. And we can, for example, design a voting system from multiple prediction programs. That we, I think that will be done easily. Um, probably uh, there is a, some kind of such meta prediction server for molecular formula. But anyway, uh, our team in Riken and some uh, people at National Institute of Genetics uh, try to use experimental support to make the formula prediction more accurate. One way is uh, using isotopes. For example, if we feed isotopically different nitrogen uh, for culture, for plant species or cultured cells, then if we measure some metabolites using mass spectrometry, those metabolites containing isotopically different nitrogen will have a different spectral shift according to the mass difference. So from this mass difference, we can at least identify the number of nitrogens. And if we can determine the number of nitrogens, it will greatly assist prediction for the number of carbons. Because quite often, uh, if we can restrict the type of elements, atomic elements, uh, we will get the right answer. So restriction on the type of elements and then determination of the number for each element. This is the crucial part. And this prediction can be assisted by the observation of neutral losses. For example, if it, when you see mass spectra uh, in this slide, you see uh, blue peaks, sharp peaks arising, and they are Mass differences are called neutral losses. And for these, for each of neutral losses, we can tentatively assign possible molecular formula like this. For example, for glycosidic compound, compounds, we observe a loss of 308 or loss of 162, depending on the type of sugars. And more um, how uh, obvious neutral losses are loss of uh, water molecule or loss of methyl group. Such small chemical groups are also appearing as neutral losses. So what we want, I'm sorry, uh, what we want to do is to assign as many as candidate molecular formula for neutral losses. And from these losses, uh, we can hypothesize, okay, this peak corresponds to the backbone structure of flavonoids or catechins. In this way, we try to predict molecular formula as accurately as possible in the initial stage. 
in order to determine the number of elements, you can uh, utilize other methods uh, like derivatization for GCMS apparatus. And I will explain this part later in a later slide. After assigning or after predicting the molecular formula of the precursor ion, then you proceed to ana analysis of secondary or fragment ion. If you are using MSMS, then there's an approach to predict a molecular formula for precursor ions and product ions simultaneously using machine learning or others. But in my opinion, those black box methods are not contributing to the knowledge of mass fragmentation. Ma fragmentation. So I would like to apply very simple, understandable rules for fragmentation as much as possible. And that's what we call hydrogen rearrangement rules. For details, uh, please refer to this paper in analytical chemistry back in 2016, but hydrogen rearrangement rules is an extension of the very well-known even electron rules. Even electron rules state that observed molecular ions in mass spectrometry are stable. So they are not in radical forms, meaning the number of electrons are always even, not odd number. And we extended these even electron rules to atomic elements like sulfur and phosphorus and determined how many hydrogens are losing or adding in the fragmentation process. And using these very simple rearrangement rules, we can assign what kind of molecular fragments are uh, possibly occurring from the precursor molecular structure. What I mean is given one molecular structure as a precursor, we first combinatorially predict possible molecular fragments using these hydrogen rearrangement rules, and then associate those hypothetical fragments with experimentally observed ones. And by this matching process, uh, you can score or you can obtain the likelihood of a particular mass spectra to a certain structure. So if there are multiple candidates for a particular mass spectra, we can score or we can order the possibility using these hydrogen rearrangement rules. And this computation is done by a software called MS Finder. And MS Finder is an associated component of the MS Dial program. So we want to uh, use a very simple rule-based approach as much as possible to increase our knowledge. And in our software comparison, in fact, this simple software, uh, well, uh, uh, software itself is not simple, but this simple principle for uh, prediction can very well compete with other AI-based methods using deep learning or using SVM and others. But usually this doesn't happen in standard molecular biology or image processing. But for metabolomics, simple rule-based method can compete simply because our knowledge or our data are not perfect yet. If obtained data are pure, 
without noise and uh, huge in amount, then machine learning methods can outperform uh, very old style rule based systems. But our results that rule based systems can work well in, in reverse indicating uh, our knowledge is not enough yet. Data are not enough and uh, there are many noises. So in this setting, rather than using artificial intelligence, my approach is to apply simple rules to find out which data part, which components are still erroneous, containing many noise and errors. And my team in Riken and NIG um, are working together to predict uh, various types of metabolites in this approach. And um, we basically collaborated with um, Professor Oliver Fien at UC Davis. And his group and my group ha are collaborating for, I think, more than, yeah, almost close to 10 years now, I think. And this Fien group uh, has a very good uh, spectral repository called, called BeamBase. And uh, his group uh, also uh, was developed, his group was developing um, a query system called BeamVestigate to look for similar spectra from multiple biological samples. So from his large collection of spectral database, we selected some spectra that are still unknown. I mean, and not yet identified. But those non-identified spectra are for sure uh, products of met metabolites. Be not noise, because the same spectra have been measured again and again from various biological samples. So we try to predict what kind of molecular structures they are. Of course, uh, this is not simple. If molecular structures are listed in a metabolic pathway or a metabolome database, then it's much easier to predict. So we hypothesize that those structures are not yet known, not in a standard molecular uh, structure library like chemical abstract service or human metabolome database. So first, based on those known molecular structures, we applied typical enzymatic reactions to produce hypothetically possible molecular structures. And against those hypothetically possible molecular structures, we run or we applied MS dial, MS finder process for prediction. The first step is molecular formula prediction, as I mentioned. And for each molecular formula, we obtain hypothetical structures and for each hypothetical structure, we applied hydrogen rearrangement rules for ranking and tested each candidate structure, whether it's a real one or not. But how we can test? The uh, crucial part is sample re-isolation and re-analysis. In the step two, sample isolation, it says reanalysis by GCMS and LCMSMS. In the GCMS step, we applied derivatization. In the derivatization process, uh, trimethyl cyril chemical group is attached to a hydroxyl group or oxygen, exposed oxygen in the molecular structure. So uh, in order to confirm 
uh, molecular structures, we can count the number of derivatized positions to see the number of exposed oxygen in the molecular structure. From the mass spectra, we predict molecular structure. And in order to uh, co confirm hypothetical molecular structure, we apply GCMS analysis for the same biological sample to identify the number of hydroxyl group. If the number of hydroxyl group is different uh, from the predicted structure, then we predict the second best one. In this way, from the GCMS analysis, we can tell the number of hydroxyl group in the molecular structure. And from LCMSMS, we reconfirm the accurate masses of the structure. And in this work, uh, presented or uh, published in Nature Method in 2018, we predicted, predicted several methylated structures. For example, this uh, particular structure is uh, UMP with methyl group. And this methylated UMP hasn't been known. It's not in the metabolic database, not in the CAS database, but only from mass spectra and from the distribution of biological samples, we could predict, well, although it's a slight modification, but we could predict this his so far unknown molecular structure only from mass spectra. So we named this type of slightly different molecular structure from a standard metabolites as epimetabolite. Epimetabolite is a bioactive compound by slight enzymatic changes from ordinary metabolite. And we hope this type of epimetabolite has a biological function, just like uh, methylation changes gene function in epigenetics. In this way, we could predict epimetabolites, uh, usually methyl molecules like N-methyl UMP or N-methyl alanine. Uh, but these are kind of small modifications. So we looked for new class of lipids in lipidomics too. Lipidomics uh, is a subfield of metabolomics focusing on lipid structures. And for lipids, uh, there are many, many complex uh, structures. For example, uh, this is an example of sphingolipid, sphingomyelin. But this sphingomyelin can be acylated in addition or glycosylated. So we looked for this type of um, different combination, conjugation uh, in lipid structures, and actually hypothetically created uh, spectral libraries for 117 lipid classes. And for those lipid classes and new names, please refer to a um, recent article in Journal of Lipid Research, JLR uh, 2020. And in this article, my name or uh, Dr. Tsugao's name uh, is not listed, but we contributed to coordinate uh, the name of lipid structures. And instead of us, uh, several names of Japanese researchers in lipid research are included as international guideline for lipid names. And the list of uh, possible lipid structures are shown in the um, website at the bottom of this slide. Ah, oh, uh, for, audience, for audience people, you don't have to write down all the information because I will send the slide to Professor Go. So uh, later you can ask him to obtain my slide. And among these 117 uh, lipid subclasses, we could find 
many new interesting repeat classes. Of course, these are all hypothetical, but for confirmation, we measured more than 10 types of mouse tissues and also cultured human cells for identification. And this picture is a supplementary figure for this recently published Nature Biotechnology article, uh, not article, it's a brief communication, a small uh, report. But in this figure, the X axis is the type of lipid classes. So there are about 120 lipid classes. And Y axis is the type of mouse tissues and cultured cells. So and yellow is abundant uh, lipid and green is absent, uh, blue is absent lipid classes. So uh, the very last line uh, shows feces. Feces is a uh, yes, fecal matter or excretion of mouse, mouse. And in feces, there are many uh, N-acyl amides or sulfonolipids. There is a very strong yellow line in the middle. And this indicates N-acyl amides are abundant in feces. Likewise, at the very left part, can, can you see my pointer uh, here? This, this uh, yellow bar indicates uh, adrenal gland. Adrenal gland is abundant in sterols. And this yellow bar indicates VLCFA, very long chain fatty acid, is abundant in testes. And uh, in skin, here, this long, uh, relatively long yellow bar uh, indicates ceramides. Different types of ceramides are abundant in skin. This is very well known because ceramides are important barrier, mm. barrier molecule uh, at the surface, at the skin surface. So it's quite understandable. So in this way, uh, we could see the distribution of all kinds of lipid classes in different uh, tissues in mouse. What we see is a striking difference depending on tissues. So it really depends on which part of the body you are looking. And currently in plant metabolomics, people tend to use the whole leaf or whole stem or whole root to identify metabolites. But my hypothesis is uh, even for plants, um, depending on the part of the tissue, at least lipid distribution should be quite different. So as we do for animal tissue, we should do similar uh, uh, analysis, detailed analysis, tissue-wise, not just entire leaf or entire flower. So uh, in summary, my recommendation for metabolic analysis uh, is first determine molecular formula accurately. This is the crucial part. You can use our software program or uh, there's a famous program called Sirius 4 developed by Sebastian Becker in Germany, Jena, uh, for formula determination. The next step is uh, you need to uh, confirm your prediction using various methods. For example, we use GCMS delivertization to confirm the number of hydroxyl groups, or uh, in the latest Nature Biotechnology uh, article, we used cross-section uh, information, CCS information, for confirm um, the accuracy of lipid identification with the help of uh, Professor Zhen Zhangzhu uh, in 
Chinese Academy of Sciences. And uh, we can uh, use other experimental methods like using isotopes uh, and NMR for structure confirmation or uh, for more accuracy. This is almost the uh, end of my talk. Um, now we are releasing MetaboBank for uh, metabolomics raw data. Actually, it started uh, last October, but um, now explanation and user guides are written only in Japanese. I'm sorry, but we will create an English version very soon. And just like a Metabolite repository uh, provides permanent uh, ID for metabolomics raw data, we also assign permanent ID uh, of MetaboBank and we'll keep all raw data together with MetaboBank, uh, Metabolites at uh, EBI. So in conclusion, uh, I explained uh, about my uh, work for the repository database and software tools. And we provide all these uh, results for free from our website and uh, other places. So please join the metabolomics community and your contribution is welcome. These are the contributors and colleagues uh, who mainly worked with our groups. Thank you for listening. Ah, go san you are muted. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Prof. Arita. So now it's the question answering sessions. Uh, do feel free to type in your question or if you want to say it in person also allowed for those in Zoom. So while waiting for the chat, I'll, have, I'll start off questions for Prof. Arita first. Like what is the major challenges for you to establish the software so far? Like the MS DAO, you use it for various platform, right? Um, so how, well, and the, the platform keep changing, keep evolving. How you make sure that your platform is forward compatible for all the different platform? Well, unfortunately, MS Dial is designed only for Windows platform, uh, not available in Macintosh. Uh, I wanted to make it how more flexible, but the main developer is Dr. Tsugawa. And he's a fan of C sharp programming language, which is available only for Windows. And we considered about uh, translating the C sharp onto Mac, but it was very difficult. So currently, MS Dial is available only for Windows machines. Um, there's a question in the chat box by uh, Dr. Zeti, our director. So uh, she said, thank you for the interesting knowledge sharing. Can you explain what is data noise? Uh, uh -huh. what, what was the, the, the noisy data and how do you differentiate it with the true or clean data? If you, and what but, do you do to eliminate the noise? Yeah, yeah that's a very big, good question. And if you uh, focus on a particular measurement, then you cannot distinguish noise from true information. So what we did is to accumulate uh, measurements as much as possible and extracted common mass spectra around the same retention time. So collection of uh, measurements is a very important step. This is exemplified by the work of Professor Oliver Fink, his laboratory has been measuring all kinds of tissue samples for more than 10 years. And we investigated only abundant spectra in those deposited uh, measurements. Of course, uh, this means we are watching only common spectra, not a rare one. However, if we focus on the rare spectra, then it's yes, uh, the how chance of hitting um, noise, just noise, is 
also large. So we wanted to make sure that we analyze real metabolites, not noise. Okay, uh, so currently the challenges of metabolomics is also their use of different company uh, mass spectrometer. And yeah. they are all different, especially for the LCMS, there'll be many different programs for yeah. the emission. So yeah. how, how, how to establish a database that's like with such variations? The key software development uh, came from a commercial company called Lightix. Uh, let me share my last slide. Um, as I said, I will uh, send this slide to Go-san, Professor Go, so uh, all audience can obtain my slides through him later. But let me re-share my screen. In this last slide, I listed Rifix Incorporated, Dr. Kanazawa, Dr. Ogiwara, Dr. Uh, Yukihira and Dr. Tada. Actually, this Dr. Tada used to be my graduate student uh, until last year. Um, these LIFEX people uh, is providing us a format converter from six major vendor formats into a common ABF format. This common ABF format is used by MS Dial for easier and faster access to vendor information. So without uh, the product of Rifix uh, incorporated, we couldn't uh, achieve uh, our efficient identification. And I think uh, if you are a software developer, you can also Rifix, uh, uh, you can also ask Rifix to use their data library for your software program. Lifex Converter is not available for everybody, but through how discussion or through negotiation, I think other developers can obtain the same uh, option or yes, same condition as uh, as we did. Okay. Okay. Um. So uh, for the software development, uh, there are plenty of like, different software out there and th there's a trend towards cloud computing, cloud analysis like XCMS. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, what do you think about uh, the standalone software compared to those like in the database well, like XCMS, yeah. the Medlin platform that going to collect all the data, all the spectra information and try to do this analysis in the cloud? No, um, the difficult part is uh, each software platform is very complicated and complicate enough uh, for other researchers to fully exploit that platform. Because MS style um, has been developed in my team, we chose MS dial, but for US people, for the US people, XMS may be the best platform. And for European people, maybe MZ Mine uh, is the best platform. Anyway, uh, I think each software platform uh, is similar in concept. But what you need is to know much about the software background and also parameter tuning. That's the most important part. If you cannot tune parameters, then uh, each software doesn't perform, it doesn't perform well. So tuning is most important part rather than the choice of software platform. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. So we have questions, some questions in the chat box. From mm -hmm. One is from Dr. Isaac. Thank you, Prof. Arita, for insightful talk. Just a question. Are the lipids from the CCS LCMS data in the Sugawa et al. 2020 validated using any reference compounds? Well, for the CCS information, reference information came from China, Professor Zhu's laboratory. So we are not actually verifying each difference. We obtain information from China. 
Okay, and another question from Dr. Ayn. Uh, most of the databases available are focusing more on mammalian metabolites. Not many databases on plant or natural product, especially on secondary metabolites. Uh, what is your suggestion on this problem? Uh, well, I hope uh, more people are uh, yes, involved in plant metabolomics because plants can produce many complex and interesting metabolites. So personally, um, I like plant metabolomics. Uh, but it's true that so many researchers are focusing on mouse and human, but it's a population problem. Uh, I cannot help it, unfortunately. <laughs> there are so many medical doctors and researchers who want to look at diseases and health problems, all kinds. Okay, so uh, there's another question from Dr. Tanjan Kit. Uh, do you assign confidence level of annotation when performing metabolite or lipid identification? Uh, yes, yes, we do. We do. Basically, we follow uh, the guideline by uh, guideline of the International Metabolomic Society. International Metabolomic Society uh, publishes a um, uh, common guideline for identification levels, but in our nature uh, method paper, 2000. 18 or maybe 19 in that paper we uh, further assigned more detailed identification identification level so uh, basically we follow the international metabolomic society okay. so in terms of the uh, metabolomic analysis the, the major challenges i think is very hard to compare data generated from different labs because they are using different mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. Even in the mm -hmm. same lab running at different time, it can be variable, the spectral results. So yeah. any comment about that? <laughs> yeah, that's a really big problem. And uh, I don't have a good solution for that problem yet. That's why we collaborated with Professor Oliver King, who have had large collection from the same platform. That's one reason we are measuring uh, various kinds of food on the same platform as food metabolomics library. So for accurate identification, actually you need to use a standardized platform. And that's a big problem of the entire community, I think. So in your opinion, what do you see the metabolomics in 10 years time? How the field will evolve with the machine learning and AI? How it will change the bottleneck of annotations on the metabolites? I think metabolomics has a really good affinity with health check. I myself, I'm not, I'm not much interested in how looking people's health status, but as a technology, very, very important and has a very high affinity with regular health checks. So uh, if you go to a health check, you uh, give out a part, tiny portion of a urine sample, tiny portion of a blood sample and all kinds. And those biological samples are tested by very crude, very simple uh, methods currently but they should be replaced with metabolomics, in my opinion, because uh, it's, uh, metabolomics learning cost is uh, much smaller and also uses very little tiny amount. So in, just in case you can reanalyze the same sample if you use metabolomics, not an old style uh, test, blood test. So um, my uh, yeah my opinion is um, for health care, metabolomics has a great potential. Do you see the mass spectrometry going smaller in the future, like yes, a lot of yes. omics technologies? Of course, of course, it will go much smaller. I'm sure. Yes, just like uh, sequencers are now a USB device. <laughs> okay. So uh, okay, there are more questions. Uh, what is your opinion on the potential of using MSN, tender mass spec, for structural elucidation? Oh, 
MSN is a very complicated process, and it's uh, how, of course, not it, it's platform dependent too. So I think MSN technology is is important, but will be limited for researchers who are interested in plant metabolomics or toxins and other special metabolites, not for ordinary metabolites in blood or urine. Okay. Uh, if there is no more questions, any question, there is no question on the Facebook Live. So I think we will close the seminar, the webinar. I would like to thank Prof. Arita again for the very interesting talk on the informatic analysis of metabolomics and lipidomic that inspire our research to the next levels. Hope the future is easier for metabolomics. <laughs> Okay, and thanks to all participants for spending time with us today. And there'll be many more webinars to come and hope to see you all again in the future. Before we end, so I want to invite everyone to switch on your camera for photo sessions. So can everyone please switch on your camera? Then we can take a group photo for, uh, for posting on the social media. And you are all welcome to post and tweet on Twitter and hashtag in biosis webinar. That will be very much welcome. <laughs> Nowadays, all social media. <laughs> so you have to hashtag Embarrassis or follow Embarrassis. Okay, everyone's on their camera. And who is going to take them? We have over 220 participants today. That is amazing, Prof. Arita. <laughs> you attracted like over 200 participants from around the world, I think. <laughs> there are a lot. Okay, I don't think everyone can fit into the view. Who is taking the photo? Is it taken? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> um, wait, wait. When we are waiting for more to come in. Okay, Dr. Imelda is taking the photo. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are nine pages, so be patient <laughs> one by one. <laughs> no, only the there are so those, many of you. those who on the video will be in. Okay, please, please, on the video, last chance, last chance for you to be in the picture. <laughs> okay, everyone, are you ready? Okay, one, smile, everyone, one, two, three. Okay, one more. One, two, three. Okay, done. Okay, so uh, please stay back for those who want to scan the QR code for the uh, attendance and e-certificate. And from Prof. Aita, thank you and hope to see you again soon after we get vaccinated. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Stay safe okay. and get vaccinated. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you for participation thank you. and invitation. Bye-bye. Stay in touch.